Okay, thank, thank you, Cheryl. Um, it's great to be here. I'm coming from uh, Northern Virginia, so uh, for those who were uh, down in the LA area, I'm sorry we brought the rainy weather here west with us, and it's, uh, it's great to be out here for a couple of days. I was also at the uh, MESAC conference um, a couple of days ago, and uh, you know, and, and I know that a lot of you came in here because you saw the title that said your cyber attack plans. So you're like, okay, finally we're going to go offensive on the threat, right? That was kind of a cheesy marketing. I, and I apologize a little bit for that, but I, I'm just the second cheesiest marketing ploy that I've seen so far, competing with me at the MESAC conference because they saw my cheesy title. They had one, the guy next to me, applications and portfolio management and tequila shots. So uh, there was no one in my briefing. Everybody was doing tequila shots. In fact, my briefing was only five minutes and we were over there next door, I took the three people. But uh, no, all serious, it's, it's great to be here. I did struggle a little bit because they wanted me to uh, load my uh, briefing onto the uh, laptop here with a thumb drive. And this, I, I use this to just kind of introduce my background a little bit. How many of you know someone in the military who's currently serving in the military or has been in the military the last five years? Anyone? Okay, ask them if they remember the day that thumb drives got banned in DOD. Would you like to meet the guy who wrote that order? That was me. I was running the uh, Department of Defense's Global Security Operations Center. We used to call it the Global Network Operations Center for JTFGNO. And that was in response to a global, uh, a global event. Uh, I was the director of the, uh, of the actual ops center. And no lie, myself and a guy named Major No, that was really his name, um, NGO, yeah, I think he was of Vietnamese descent, um, sat down shoulder to shoulder and we, we wrote that out. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you have some friends in the military and you tell them you met the guy who wrote the order, they, they may want to know my address and come punch me out because uh, it was a very, very emotional event for us. So um, we're going to talk about three things today. Um, we're going to talk about the threat landscape. We're going to talk about some of my observations, not only in the year that I've spent with Dell. I, I, I retired from the military uh, last summer. Um, I've spent a year with Dell. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, observations I've seen um, across other enterprises, as well as we'll get into what I think that you're here for, and that's how to put together your incident response plan. Um, so, so you should walk out of here with a pretty good idea what your framework of your incident response plan should look like. 
So moving to the threat landscape. Um, how many of you attended uh, RSA last year? Anyone? Okay, so uh, one of the best uh, parts of RSA was they actually had the FBI director, uh, former director, uh, Director Mueller was there. And he said these three things, and I, and I pulled these out because we hear, this, we hear this discussion from our customers all the time. My company is too small, no one would know. Or my government uh, system, you know, my, my agency is too small, no one, ever, no one will ever find me. We're finding that's not true. In fact, we're finding that the, the threat is actually targeting the smaller organizations to use as a, as a launching point to bigger opportunities. I thought this was pretty powerful that they think that, that the uh, FBI director thinks that this will be the number one threat to our country. Um, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty uh, powerful statement. And, and I think that it, that, it, that it shows that we're probably not putting a lot of the emphasis behind being ready for, for a major cyber event. Um, and then I've heard this many times from folks yeah, but I've never been able to attribute it. So when Director Mueller said it, now I can attribute it to him. There are two, two, two organizations out there. There are people who know that they've been hacked and the ones that don't know it yet. So that kind of leads to the incident response. So I am originally from South Carolina. Um, and we've always wanted to be number one in something. You know, we tried to get number one in the education, but we're still hovering in the 40s. But we're, we're working at that. Um, but when you look up, look at the major breaches, um, when you look at, I checked about six or seven different websites that had ranked all the major breaches for last year. The state of South Carolina, and you heard Dave DeWalt talk about it, is still the number one breach of, uh, of last year. Um, for those of you who don't know the background, um, appears that cyber criminals compromised a uh, server that had unencrypted uh, Personal or personal identifiable information on about seven million residents of the state of South Carolina. So uh, this is the governor saying they could have done more to protect the uh, personal data of the residents. Um, as you can see, the director um, resigned. You know, which is code word for he was asked to resign. Um, and then some, some other quotes that uh, came from, from the article that I read on this. Um, basically just shows that they, they, they really didn't think about preparing themselves to be able to, re to not only protect themselves, but be able to respond. Um, not, you know, I know that we have a mixture of both government and uh, university uh, system security folks here, so I'd like to bring in a university example. Um, again, uh, the, uh, the uh, University of Delaware had about 72,000 um, records exposed. We see this a lot in public universities. In fact, I've got another example of a university. They, they were not one of our clients. So that's why I, I pulled them out as, a, as an example. Um, they noticed about five days after the hackers had exploited this particular web server that, uh, that they had an incident. And this is, the, this is the money slide, literally, or the money, uh, you know, 13 to $19 million to remediate. So for those of you security managers, leaders, directors, who are trying to make that business case to your, to your leadership on what, you know, what does it cost to protect ourselves? What does it cost to be ready to respond? You've got some hard data points that you can dig into. So why is the risk? What, why, why are we having these issues? Um, both in the public sector for universities as well as state governments, um, I've seen many instances where hacktivists are going after local police departments. You know, the, 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 uh, I think it's the Arapahoe County in, in, uh, um, in Arizona gets attacked all the time. And again, they use that uh, launching point because hacktivists are interested in policy and making statements on policies and they love to redirect your uh, websites to, uh, to get their global message out. A lot of cases um, with universities as well as state government, it's just in, as in the case with the uh, state of South Carolina, they're trying to do identity theft and, uh, and personal gain or, uh, or financial gain. So there's a criminal element that's, uh, that's also going after you. And then in some universities, it's just students that want better grades, and I pulled this local example here. Um, 
of uh, 60 former students were uh, investigated for possibly changing their grades. So a uh, lot, lot, uh, lot of reasons for, and, and motivations for attacking, but then what's the, what, why are they successful? I don't know how many of you have been following up on uh, some of the uh, talk of Joomla WordPress and some of those other web applications. The great thing about these web applications is they're very, very easy to, to write and, and it really is a very functional um, framework for you to be able to uh, go out and, uh, and, and very quickly take care of things and automate things. What do you think the bad thing is about Joomla? Anybody want to take a guess? Easy to write. They're easy to write, exactly. They're easy to use. Everybody can write a program. So then how do you manage that? So what you have is a very wide surface area of attack for, for threat actors, for state and university targets, and then you have the motivation. So it's a really simple um, equation here, risk equal threat plus your vulnerabilities. When you overlay those two, you can see that, uh, that you got to spend a little bit of time to be ready. Um, like I say, I've been doing this since about 2000, you know, I've been, I worked in the Department of Defense for 24 years before I retired last summer, and I probably spent most of that time being a service provider, but the last seven years I spent defending the uh, Department of Defense uh, networks. And so as I did that, it's, it's, you know, Dave DeWalt said in his initial um, keynote is you got to understand why people are attacking you. And, and I think when you understand the threat landscape and the why, I can really only break it into six reasons. Um, I've been challenging the audiences to come up with another reason so I can add it. I actually only started with two and after about three briefings I got it up to six. But uh, um, as you can see, if you go back and you, you reflect on your organization, am I vulnerable to being, being exploited? If you fit any of these categories, I think that you, you ought to take a hard look and make sure that you're ready. I don't think anybody can, can uh, take themselves out of this category. We all have former employees and current employees that are probably not happy. Um, activists, you see that a lot going after government sites. Uh, maybe a little bit of competitive advantage, financial crime, definitely not a lot of state espionage, and of course, um, if you have any intellectual property, especially universities. Universities really have a lot of great, rich data that they have on their networks, and they have a hard time protecting it. So now we're going to talk about the range of actors, and I'm just going to spend a real quick um, broad overview on this because I've got three slides that kind of dr drill down into this. First, you have what we call the commodity threat. The commodity threat are, are the cr mostly criminal elements, hacktivists sometimes, um, who are just not necessarily targeting your particular organization. They are casting a wide net, looking to catch a few big fish. And uh, so a lot of times when you find the commodity threat on your networks, a lot of times your signature-based security controls will catch them. And a lot of times when you find them and eradicate them, they're probably done until they send another phishing email out and you happen to be a victim to that again. But you notice, you know, this blue shows that uh, of what organizations can usually handle organically. As you can see, there's a little bit of a gap there with the commodity threat, and we'll talk about that on the slide. The next level up we have, uh, as far as threat and hard to detect and defend against, are the hacktivists and former employees. We kind of group those two together. One, because the hacktivists have moved up from the commodity threat and have moved into a uh, more targeted uh, capability with, and a little harder to detect. And everybody always knows the former employee, current employee that's not having a good time is one of the most difficult people to detect and respond against. Cyber criminals have moved up into the advanced targeted threats. It used to be they did a lot of smash and grab, but there are criminal gangs that work like businesses. They have a software development life cycle like you have inside your business and they are working to get big payoffs. Um, you know, we, some of you looking at yourself and say, well, I don't, you know, I, you know, I don't really have, you know, I, I do ACH transfers, but uh, you know, I don't have, you know, that big of a payday. These guys, we've seen them go after as, low, as little as 10,000, and, uh, and in some cases, going after ACH transfers in the millions. 
and not as relevant in this forum, although with the universities targeted, uh, the uh, nation state actors are, are an issue and they are targeting universities. For, so those of you representing uh, universities and uh, in higher education, um, again, they're going after your, uh, your um, intellectual property. Very difficult to, uh, to detect, and, and we got a slide that goes into that. Um, is everybody in here security folks? Do we have any non-security folks in here? That's actually a trick question, because even if you're an IT service provider, you're supposed to say, well, we all do security, so that's good. Everybody got that. Okay, so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. Uh, at the MESAC uh, conference, uh, there, you know, it was kind of a mixed crowd of security folks and, and, uh, and IT CIO types. So let's talk about a couple of case examples to kind of highlight some of the, what we've seen internal to Dell SecureWorks. This particular organization is, uh, and I tried to make all my case examples on the East Coast. So there should be little to no risk that any of these people are in this audience, unless they look at the YouTube video. So uh, we gotta figure out a way to whitelist the whole East Coast. But no, nah, we, we, uh, we obfuscate the customer's data a little bit in the, in the event, so, um, and, and most of our customers don't mind us sharing these uh, with the uh, audience as long as you can't tell who it is. So this is an example of a commodity threat. Um, the W2, uh, W2 change-up, Vobis. How many of you got hit with that last year? I'd be, you, know, you probably don't want to raise your hand. But uh, it was very, very widespread. We probably worked about 12 cases on this. And it was a commodity threat. But the reason why I like to highlight this, even though it was a commodity threat, it, it was still not being detected by AV because it was polymorphic in nature. It was cha constantly changing a signature. And, um, and it was a worm, so once it got inside your infrastructure, it spread over open sh file shares. And really, it even attacked my church in Virginia, believe it or not. Um, I actually had our, uh, our pastor stand up and say, I lost my sermon today, so I'm doing it from memory because we've been a victim of a cyber attack. And I was sitting there thinking, is God punishing me for something? Did I do something bad? Um, but uh, it, 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 that's how widespread it was. And, and in some cases, in this particular case, it was followed up by criminal tradecraft. So the initial foothold was to get on the network with widely, abu uh, uh, widely available and widely used uh, um, initial tool and tradecraft. And then uh, we found Zeus and other criminal wear that came in behind. So, uh, so like I said, very, very widespread and uh, at least 10 to 12 cases that we did that last year. The other one I like to throw up here, this is a, this is a state level university enterprise, and I, I use that very purposefully because this particular state, they all, they, they all had, uh, all fell under one enterprise, but it was multiple campuses. Um, probably similar to some of the way the state universities here in Florida, I am here in uh, California work. Um, they actually have a good security team. This is not an incompetent organization, but look what happened to them. Their security team detected a, lo lo a large file transfer, and after further investigation, they actually found a query server that had been public facing for two years. And they only detected it when they saw the file transfer go through, the, uh, through their security controls at the perimeter of their network. So uh, we, we were able to put somebody on the ground um, we, we, we were able to recreate what the malicious actor, the query that the malicious actor had run, and we discovered that it returned about 298,000 PII records. Um, so uh, again, this, and we'll talk a little bit about understanding your environment and making sure that you, you, can, you have good positive control of your environment. This is probably one of our favorite ones to talk about. This is the uh, advanced persistent threat. Um, this particular um, actor was, uh, was struggling to get onto this network. The security controls on the network were actually pretty good. So they actually went and found a home user. This particular organization, how many of you use Citrix for remoting into your networks? Everybody, a lot of you? Okay, so they, they, they kept bouncing off the security controls of this company. So they actually went through social media and found a home user and actually exploited their home user's network. How many of you have teenagers in your house? 
How many of you have their systems on a different subnet and actually go out and buy a different ISP service provider for them? That's probably the best security control you can have. I don't know for sure, uh, I don't have that level of granularity for this case, but they, they were able to compromise the home system of this particular worker and just dropped a simple key logger, the uh, VPN that they logged onto, Citrix, username and password. Once they had that, then they were no longer, they never used Tradecraft on the network, they just logged onto the network. And that's what your advanced persistent thread does. They, they logged onto the network, they found, they found the intellectual property that they wanted, they dropped it into a draft email while they were on the Citrix, they opened up an email client, they uh, dropped the, the uh, documents that they wanted into a draft email, closed it, and then opened a web out, a web access, Outlook Web Access OWA session outside the network, and then we're able to pull the documents down, completely bypassing DLP, DRM, and, and the, uh, as well as all the other security controls that they had to protect those documents leaving their environment because they just had not thought that the threat would think of that. So that's what you're up against. Um, that, that takes you from the, from the commodity threat down to the, uh, um, down to the uh, most sophisticated threats that we've seen here in Dell SecureWorks. So now we're going to talk about the observations of what we've seen these threats, what we've seen the threat do. This is based off of our caseload that we worked in 2012. As you can see, th this is percentage and this is, uh, we use the Veris framework to define these uh, terms. So if you're one of those tick sticklers who wants to know how you define these terms, you can look these up in the Veris framework. Um, but as you can see, about 50%, we're still seeing that the end user is the major target. But what, what we've noticed and what, what a lot of us have observed is that the actors are going directly after servers and applications. Remember we talked about Joomla, WordPress, and all those vulnerabilities. It's not that those are bad software packages, it's just they're hard to patch, they're hard to keep up with. There's so many security vulnerabilities. We had a customer that we did a scan against their uh, web applications and uh, we found one of their web servers had an appendix that was a thousand pages long of vulnerabilities to patch. A thousand pages. I didn't think that was possible. Still see them going after network infrastructure. Usually what happens there is that's a, uh, somebody does a ping sweep, they get a return, they go check out that, that router, find out that the default password is still usable, they log on and they become a, uh, they become a network engineer for that company. Um, data storage is, is uh, coming in last. Um, the vectors, seeing a lot of, uh, you know, obviously malware is still the, uh, the uh, most preferred method, and out of that, um, about 10% of the vectors are socially engineered, which means it's targeted malware. We saw one case where a uh, supplier was compromised and sent out billing to 32 customers, a PDF that said, here's your invoice for, for this. Who wouldn't open up that you know, email? So, uh, so we're seeing some more sophistication in, in social engineering. Um, all kinds of misconfigurations, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the cases I cited with a uh, router giving a uh, return on a ping sweep. And then there's a lot of direct hacking. And direct hacking is SQL injects, buffer overflows, iframe um, redirects. There's all kinds of vulnerabilities that, that hackers are going right after the uh, servers. So my general observations, and I think that uh, Dave DeWalt talked about this extensively yesterday. Most of us don't have an ID, IT uh, architecture designed for security. You know, we talk about, he talked about building that Maginot line. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, tough, it's tough to build a, a, a Maginot line around a, an environment that was never meant to be defended. So if, you, if you're the type of organization that has 10 locations and 10 internet access points and you're in the same city, that's a problem. Um, that's hard to defend. It's expensive to, de to defend. Um, poor asset visibility. We talked about the case of the uh, university that had the server, the uh, query server out there that, that they didn't know about that could actually touch every other SQL server in their environment. You know, having, having the ability to constantly see what you're exposing through your internet access points is, is definitely a, uh, a, something you want to do. 
Um, security operations centers, we see a lot of the bigger ones have the security incident event management capability, whether it's ArcSight, Splunk, um, you name that capability, but they have no analytics. And I'll, I'll, I'll do a little confession here. I, I ran that in the security operations center that I ran in for the Army. Um, you know, we had one of the largest SIMs I think ever attempted, and we had a lot of data in our SIMs, but we had no analytics to tell me what was important. So having the analytics to tell you what's that needle in the stack of needles that's really important that you need to look at, that's, you know, I see a lot of folks with, with SIMs, but, but no, no analytics. A structured approach to uh, security incident tracking. What this means, how many of you run a, how many of your organizations run a help desk? All right, and so does your help desk have a meeting about once a month to go over incidents that they've done to say, okay, what's the trend? What are we seeing? You know, uh, we're, we're, we seem to be having a lot of problems with uh, X, you know, XP doing this or, or that or blue screen of death with this particular, never a Dell system, but maybe another um, competitor system. You know, they're, they're doing analytics to figure out what are the trends so they can try to get ahead of the problem. Um, very few organizations do that in security, um, of, in security management. Uh, so uh, you, you want to have a, uh, a workflow system that, that, can, that you can grab that critical data for what you're seeing across your environment, especially if you run a complex environment that you're constantly running incident response. Um, a lot of people think that incident response is just something I do in a point in time, but incident response is something that you do constantly. Um, secure, some compli a lot of folks do compliance monitoring instead of security monitoring. You get that uh, zero day, you finally get that zero day IE patch down on patch Tuesday and you know that hacker Wednesday is coming right behind it so you go out and you're going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to patch as many machines as I can. But, but how many folks will sit there and, and organize your approach to patching to make sure you do your most critical systems first? And some of them you may not, I mean, how many of you struggled trying to get uh, your, your uh, organizations to patch a Java exploit and they'll tell you, well, it'll break my application if you change Java, I mean Java. So understanding how you can integrate your, uh, your ability to do compliance um, and security management with your security team is, and your IT service provider is, is something that we don't see. See a lot of folks with an instant response plan, I'm gonna fix this for you guys today. You know, we're gonna tell you what an instant response plan should look like. Um, but uh, I see a lot, probably all of you in here have an instant response plan because you have some group of initials that tell you that you do have to have an instant response plan, some type of regulated body, but very few will uh, exercise it. And many of them are outdated and a lot of them are just you know, check the block. You know, I got audited, here's my incident response plan, it's 300 pages, so I made it big so you won't read it. We call that fleshing it out in the, in the beltway. Um, and, then you, uh, and then you move on. Um, the other thing that we see a lot is, you know, there may be some folks in here that are forensics folks, and they'll, they'll say, yep, I'm, I'm the forensics person for this organization, I'm school trained, I have GREM, I have, uh, GCIH, you know, I've got all those great certifications. Then you start asking them, okay, what's, what, how do you do incident response and what capabilities do you have? A lot of times what we see is there is a huge gap in people being, there, there's really three major components to incident response. There's network forensics, there's system forensics, and 90% of the people who say that they are forensics people are system forensics people. And they're good at it, you know, they can hook up in case, they can hook up FTK, they can index a drive and they can explore a drive. But uh, you, very, you find very few who have a lot of experience with network um, forensics. And network forensics is really hard if you don't have intelligence to apply for what you're looking for in the network stream. So you can look at a whole bunch of data, but if you don't know what the bad stuff is, you know, kind of like the SIM and the analytics, then you, you, you really, it's really tough to do network, you know, network forensics. And then, and then the last piece is malware analysis. So malware analysis is more than the AV hitting it and you're looking at it and you verify the MD5 hash and you say, okay, delete all these. You know, let me go scan my environment and delete all these. Malware analysis is dropping it into an engine or a tool that breaks that malware apart and it looks for those other network indicators 
um, that you need to look for on your, to, to help you go find more infected hosts on your networks. It'll have call out domains, it'll have get requests. Um, you know, there could be MD5 hash, but you can't really count on that because most of the uh, stuff is, uh, is polymorphic and changes. So, so you really got to make sure that you have those skills on your staff. And, um, and sometimes it's, you know, I know, I know in the trade, I've looked in a trade magazine, to, to have someone who's good in all three of those skills, being able to do malware analysis, network analysis, and system analysis, their pay is about 150000 a year. So it's tough for a smaller organization to keep that skill set inherent to, the, to, the, uh, to their staff. And DDoS is a wicked problem. I mean, I, I used to laugh off DDoS, but DDoS is, is a big problem now. And, they, and DDoS is hitting everybody. If, you, you know, if you're thinking, well, DDoS, I'll never get a DDoS on my, myself. If you do ACH transfers, you'll get hit with a DDoS. Because what they'll do is they will get on your network, they will do an ACH transfer, criminals will, and then they will, they will DDoS you right after the ACH transfer for two reasons. One, what do you do when you have a DDoS, if you're IT staff and security staff? You run around like your hair is on fire. So it distracts you. The second piece, the more brilliant piece is, they do the DDoS just long enough that you can't pull back that ACH transfer. There is a time limit on how long you can have an ACH transfer out and can pull it back. So we've seen, seen the criminal gangs really, really pull this lever a lot. And they're doing it at all levels, because it's easy. Commodity threat, um, talked about them a little bit on the other slide, but the, the thing that we're seeing is they're leveraging zero days within 36 hours. The latest Internet Access, the uh, latest Internet Explorer zero day was in the Black Hole framework and Metasploit framework, which are the two. You can actually go with your credit card online. You can buy these two frameworks for, that's probably what most of you thought you were coming in here to hear, is how to use Metasploit and, uh, and others to go attack back. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, within 36 hours, they can grab those, those zero days and put them back into that framework. That's incredible. I'd love to study their software development lifecycle because they've got it down pretty quick. Um, they're becoming, the uh, criminal gangs are becoming more sophisticated. They, like I said, they run like a business. They have people that create malware, that create the exploits. They have people who create the uh, targeted emails. And then they have a different group that sends them out. And, it's, and it truly is a business. They run it like a business. I had a three-star boss that I worked for in the Army. I don't know where he got this quote from, so I'm, I'm using him as the source. He used to say in speaking events all the time that, uh, that this right here is actually more profitable and, and we're seeing more revenue than you're seeing in drug trade. It's incredible. I mean, just billions of dollars going out the door every day. And they are aggressive. They are sending out thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of emails. And again, they throw a wide net and they just hope they get a couple of folks um, snagged. Now, the targeted threat, you notice we don't call them the advanced persistent threat within Dell. We call them the targeted threat because we think the advanced persistent threat is not a good, um, good descriptor, descriptor of who these guys actually are. Um, but the difference is, is a targeted threat has picked your organization as a target. And it could have started off with something as simple as a Google search. And anything, any information that you had that was outward facing that they were interested in, now you've become, you've gotten into their crosshairs and they're going to figure out how to, to exploit you. But guess what? They still get in through phishing. As Dave DeWalt said in his keynote yesterday, phishing and and the web are still the most two popular ways that they get in, because, and they will use tradecraft that they can buy with a credit card um, because they want to hide in the commodity threat. And has anybody ever heard of water holding attacks? Everybody know what that is? You've heard of it? So water holding attacks is different in the fact that we see this a lot in DC. What they'll do is they will compromise a web server that they know the key, key leaders go to, and, and then they will exploit it. And then when people go to visit, they get exploited. So they never have to send you an email. You know, it comes through the HTTP traffic. A good case in point, think, think tanks are a huge target for the targeted threat. Um, they're constantly uh, changing their tradecraft to evade, evade countermeasures. I know, uh, um, you know, you have a lot of folks saying, I've got the tool that's going to solve all the problems. You've heard folks say that in this conference. No one has the tools that's going to solve the problem. Because as soon as a, a new tool comes out, a countermeasure comes out. 
So then we come up with a countermeasure to the countermeasure. And, that, and that's how it works. I mean, no, no one has infallible security, so you can't buy a tool that's going to stop this. So you got to be ready to respond. And, uh, and the uh, targeted threat is very, um, they're very patient. If they get discovered or you change something on your network, they'll drop back and they'll start over because they're in for the long game. DDoS operations, the only thing that I'll cover on this is, is that the criminal gangs are using it to cover ACH activity in your environments, most likely. Um, you may get hit by a hacktivist if you're a university or a government organization that maybe does something that's, uh, um, that they think is uh, very um, uh, controversial, then you may get hit from them, but, but, the, but it is a wicked problem because they're, they're not using home systems anymore to, to generate the bandwidth for these DDoSs. They're using high availability, high, capa high, high availability, high bandwidth web servers, and there are hundreds of thousands of vulnerable web servers out there that they, that they have in their bot armies, and, uh, and they're killing you on layer, layer, layer three and layer four. And in some cases, they're going directly after the application and injecting code into your applications that cause your applications to uh, crash. Um, so, uh, seeing it in, in a couple of ways. I won't spend too much time on the data. This is just about making the, uh, the case to your uh, bosses that, uh, that there is a, a true cost to breaches. Um, these will be available in the slide. The main thing I want to talk about is in this particular study, the Phenomenon Institute, um, you can great, he, he, this, this uh, particular study says you can greatly uh, reduce your, your uh, time and your costs by having an incident response plan and having the engagement of people to help you with the data breach. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about next. How do you put together that incident response plan? Um, I can tell you that uh, um, we didn't create this framework that we use at Dell SecureWorks. Um, this, is, this is what we got from several sources, and when you look at how people do incident response plans, they all do them, they all kind of follow this flow. Um, you're, you're operating, everything's green, then you detect an event that sends you into a period of what we call identification, analysis, then you go to notification, containment, eradication, recovery, and um, post-incident. I've actually got a slide on every one of these, so I won't talk in detail on all these. Um, this is actually what we created, which is our swim lanes, and this is in the slide brief. If, you look, if you're looking for a place to look at your plan to see if it has this methodology, um, this is in the slide deck that's available, be available online. As I said, we didn't create this. Um, we used the NIST standards, um, 800-61 and 800-86. I'm from the Department of Defense, so I also pulled some of the documentation from the department to overlay our processes and how we build incident response plans for our customers. Um, and then of course, uh, the SANS training and certification is probably, to me, is best of breed. So if you get the opportunity to send your incident responders to that training, they get some very valuable information at those training sessions. So this is what a plan should look like. Uh, most of the plans that I look at, or my team looks at, is basically just this. It'll, it'll talk about roles and responsibilities, description of the process, identify the, the events and the workflows, and sometimes, if you're lucky, has the phone numbers of the third-party providers. But what's missing are these playbooks, because ha this is usually two to 300 pages if you do it right. If you really go into the level of depth into your net of, of what, what you want to uh, accomplish your answer and response plan, this is actually a pretty big document. And as you can see, it's policies and guidelines. And, and policies and guidelines, those, those of us who, who are in the management role know that you don't change policy very often. So, so this is kind of the framework that your incident response plan operates off of. What's, what we see missing from a lot of folks are playbooks. And, and this is what's most criti critical when you actually have an incident. You need to, and this is more checklist driven. So this is when you bring the team together you give, you give them a check, you know, you give every, you know, first off your team's identified for every incident every type of incident, so whether it's a DDoS, whether it's a compromised server, whether it's a compromised host or a group of compromised hosts, you have a different playbook for every one of those events. And that's what you pull out when you're doing the incident response and you go through that checklist and, and, um, and it has key things in there like the phone numbers for the third party sort of providers. Um, that is really critical because what you don't want to be doing is, is 
digging around for phone numbers while you're in the middle of a firefight. The identification phase, um, probably uh, the one that's skipped most often. Events just seem to happen and people go right into analysis. Um, identification phase is, and I know you can't read this, but this is basically when you're confirming what you saw as a, what you think is a detection event. So you may get something that pops on your SIM that says this particular host is talking to a bad IP. So then you may run that down and call the user or, or investigate further and you may find that, hey, that user just went to a bad IP because they were doing something they probably shouldn't have been doing going to a part of the internet they shouldn't be going to. And then you go check the host and you know, then you go back to regular operations. So identification can, can come about in, in many different ways. Um, the ones that are most scary to me is when the help desk calls and says, hey, I just had a sys, a sys admin call in and they said that someone has logged on to their domain controller and they don't recognize this user account. That's bad. <laughs> so so having all, understanding what all those inputs are to the identification is, is something that you definitely want to, to outline. And then you want to, before you move to the next stage of, of analysis, again, this is in the playbook, you want to have that criteria that says, yep, this is an incident. You know, so if it's, uh, say if it's a mal, you know, say if it's a compromised server, you know, you may want to be able to say, um, okay, this file is definitely not a file that should be on this server, or this login is not a uh, login that's authorized. Then you would move on to the next stage, which is, to me, the most important part, and that's the analysis phase. When you get to the analysis phase, I, I'll always like to say it's real easy. You create three columns. What you know, what you don't know, and what you're going to do about it. You're going to have a whole bunch of stuff in your list of things that you, that you know and you don't know. And what you want to do is you want to migrate all, you want to investigate and do analysis on all those things you don't know. And everything that you know needs to be in that column because it drives something in what you're going to do to, uh, in your containment and eradication plan. So this, this is uh, when you want to bring in your high-skilled incident response staff that, that have the forensic capability, whether it's internal or external support. And it's really kind of a simple process. Simple, simple to talk about, but complex to do. Um, you, you're always going to have probably identified host that's been compromised. So you, you, so you, have, you start off with a host. You do the forensic analysis on the host to identify any indicators that you can pull off there that you can go look for more host. You, you, you pull any tradecraft, any files that shouldn't be on there that appear to be tradecraft, and then you do the malware analysis, and then that's going to give you more threat indicators. And then you go back to your network logs, and you do the, uh, and do the log analysis, your syslog analysis, to see if you can find more, more infected host. So, uh, so that's the process for analysis. And that's where it brings, where you have to have those skills of being able to do network analysis, system analysis, and then malware analysis. And, and that's where most folks don't have all those skills inherent to their staff. The next is the notification stage. And, and a lot of times I probably see this as the second most skipped phase. In fact, a lot of times I see people doing analysis and containment at the same time, bad. Because what happens if, especially when it's a targeted threat, if they see that you're actually doing something on your network to contain them, they will go dark and they will wait. Um, so you want to, but you, you do want to do the notification. And this notification plan doesn't mean that you notify everybody outside the organization. This is an internal meeting to brief what you found in the analysis and what your containment plan is and what your eradication plan to your decision makers and key stakeholders within the organization so that everybody has buy-in on what, what the next step is. Then you go to containment. And containment isn't just you folks sitting in here that are security staff. Containment is a joint venture between the users, the uh, IT service providers, and the leadership, and the, and the security staff. You're going to change password. You're going to force password change. You may require additional training for your users so that this doesn't happen again. Um, you're going to uh, probably go and, and uh, purge your active directory, you know, if your active directory uh, process was compromised, you, you may have to do some really big remediation there. Um, but this is, you know, you push those IPS and, and DNS, there's IP and DNS blocks. Um, AV is still good in the containment plan because uh, once you push those, those 
files up to the service providers. They send you a DAT file down. You can detect and verify that you you found all the instances. And um, and then if you have the capability to do DNS black holing, that's 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 great. And then you come to the eradication plan. So now that you've identified and you've cut the threats off, you you, you now have to identify all the hosts and all their pivot points. And this is where most organizations struggle to. Uh, to be able to pull all that together. Um, and, uh, and again, it's, it's being able to do that network analysis to see what other hosts have the same indicators of compromise of what you've found so far. And then the last part um, that is mostly the IT is the recovery. That's going back to normal operations. So if you had to rebuild some servers, you do that. Um, if it's just a couple hosts you had to pull offline, you provide new capabilities to those users. And then, uh, and then you go back to normal operations. High five, we're done, right? Everybody goes home, goes to sleep. Because you've been up for 48 hours, right? Wrong. Pretty close, I mean, you may want to go get three hours of sleep, but pretty close to the event you want to do post-event activities. And you want to go through those, remember I said those playbooks constantly change? This is when you change and update those playbooks. And this is when you say, okay, this didn't make sense that we did this, let's not do this next time. Or this person, this, IS, this third party provider's changed and we had the wrong phone number, let's put the right phone number here for next time. So this is a, a critical step. This is just the uh, instant response models to consider and it really, there is no answer, um, but you can do, I mean, I, I look at it three simple ways. You can, you can do it yourself, um, which is the most responsive, but as I talked about, to get those high dollar skills inherent to your staff is tough. The other tough thing is, is those people like to, those people like to be elbows deep into analysis all the time. And you may not generate enough work for them. So, uh, so if, if you do feel like that you're gonna have enough incidents that you can justify the cost, you can do it all in-house. I prefer the, uh, the hybrid model the three-wheeled motorcycle. I know they don't look cool when you drive them down the, motor, down the highway, but, uh, um, but that's where you got the, leader, the leadership of the incident response. That incident commander is resident to the organization, but then you bring some outsourced talent in to augment your staff to do the things that you don't want to keep on your staff all the time and advise the staff. And, and a lot of people su would, are surprised when I throw this one out there to 100% outsource it, but I, I, I was at a uh, banking conference and I was talking to this gentleman after the conference and he said, yeah, I'm the president of the bank. And I was like, wow, that's great that you would come to a security conference. That shows great security, for a uh, great uh, support for your IT staff. He goes, well, I'm also the IT guy. So, so there are some small organizations that, that it may make sense to just completely outsource their incident response. And, uh, you know, and you'd be surprised at what the cost would be. Um, so this is, this is kind of the slide to bring it all together. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you pick your model, um, develop your plan with that model in place, and then exercise it. You know, having a third party come in and do a, uh, do a tabletop, I think, is, is best practice. The last thing here, you can't see the slide, but there, these are some great resources to go out. The top one, of course, is Ardell SecureWorks. Uh, um, uh, website, but there are other SANS, the NIST website, to go out there and, uh, and, and go out and try to uh, do some research if you want to build your own plan. Subject to your questions, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I apologize, I had to get through a lot in 45 minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you kept talking about targeting. Yes. Is there a problem legally and technically with setting up a distraction zone for attackers? No, honey pots are perfectly legal. I'm not a lawyer. You may want to talk to your legal counsel, but uh, many organizations we do a honey pot op operations as part of our security intelligence. Um, I've never heard. I mean, there's a certain ways that you've got to do it, but uh, I, I, you know, it is something that a lot of organizations do. Any other questions? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, sir. What's that? Okay. All right. Thank you very much.